Hello, this is Brian Hayden once again, uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about the prehistoric importance of soup. Now, soup may not be uh, one of your favorite kinds of foods, or you may not uh, think it's very important, but in fact, there is, um, prehistorically, there's a lot of inf in indication that soup was uh, something special. So we'll talk about that. And uh, there's a few background issues that we need to uh, mention before we get started. Uh, and so I'll try to go through those briefly. The first is that uh, one of the most important priorities in traditional lifestyles, especially in the northern climates, uh, is keeping warm. Uh, survival depends on that. And keeping and maintaining body heat is essential. Uh, but fires are not the best way to do that. Uh, fires are difficult to keep going all day and all night, and they require a lot of wood, a lot of work. Uh, they also only heat one, one side of you at a time. Um, so most people don't rely on fires uh, very much to keep warm. On occasion, yes, but uh, one of the main strategies that they use to keep warm is body heat uh, and clothing, of course. Um, and uh, so the, um, the main key, the second point is the main key to maintaining body heat is to have adequate food, uh, calorie rich food. And that means basically starches, including uh, sugars, which are a very refined type of starch, uh, and lipids. Lipids include fats and greases and oils, uh, whether from plants or animals. So um, starches are pretty rare to get in the wintertime, especially if there's snow on the ground, etc. So uh, we look at uh, animal fats and greases and oils primarily in the wintertime to keep warm in most environments. Um, so the, uh, the problem with animals, animal fats, is that uh, they're relatively short supply as well in wild environments, wild animals. Wild animals basically have about 5% body fat, um, more or less, a lot of times less. And if there is, uh, and that's in comparison to store-bought meat that we're familiar with today, uh, which has more like 25 or 30% body fat or more. And, um, and so you can see the big difference. And in fact, if there's not enough fat in the, um, in the animals, uh, we can't digest the protein. So the first thing hunters do in hunting and gathering societies is to open up the intestinal cavity and check to see how much uh, body fat there is in the intestines. And if there's not enough, a lot of times they leave it and leave the animal and don't, uh, don't eat it. Uh, in fact, there's something called rabbit starvation uh, because rabbits can be very lean. And uh, if that's all you've got to eat and don't have enough fats or starches or lipids, um, then you eat pounds of meat every day and you're still starving. So... Um, Getting fats out of the environment and out of animals is very important. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, we've developed a very strong taste for um, fats and oils and starches and sugars uh, throughout evolution uh, because people who had this natural taste for, for these rich foods uh, tended to survive a lot better than people that did not have that taste. So to, even today, we have uh, when the opportunity uh, presents itself to eat rich foods, we go for it. Uh, in in most cases, in a lot of cases. Okay, so uh, that's our genetic propensity, part of what makes us human. But we need we need fats to digest the protein. We need lipids. Okay, so uh, we try to get that from hunted animals prehistorically. And the third thing that we need to know is where the fats are produced. The fats are produced largely in bones. Um, we may not have thought about bones before, but here's one. Uh, 
Uh, and we've got two parts of the bone that are important for fats. We've got the central long bones, the, and here I'm talking about long bones, uh, which is where the marrow is. That's a real concentrated uh, kind of fat and is very highly prized. And then we've got the ends, uh, which has more spongy kinds of, <clears throat> spongy looking kinds of bone material. And that's mainly where the, the fats are um, obtained or produced. And so uh, we've got two possibilities. We can e easily crack open this, this bone uh, and get the marrow um, from the bone. That's easy to extract. So I can uh, we get the, uh, the marrow just like that. Here's the marrow. And that can be taken out, uh, very fat rich. Um, and then we also have the cancellous or spongy kinds of tissue. Oh. Gotta be careful about my fingers here. Um, and you can see that's all concentrated up here. It's uh, maybe a little bit difficult to see, but at any rate, that's where the spongy tissue is. Little, little cells where the fat is produced. And uh, that is difficult to get out. Uh, and so what we need is some means of doing that. Uh, the Neanderthals uh, looks like they basically uh, mashed up the ends of the bones uh, into a, a paste, basically, and then would chew on that and get out the fats. Uh, when we get into uh, modern humans, um, especially in Europe and North America, uh, what we find is that they developed another technique. And that technique involves uh, breaking up the bones into small bits and then putting them in a pot to boil. And that boils out the greases that come to the top. And what you have is soup. And that is why soup is so important uh, prehistorically. It's a way of getting out some of those fats. It's a rich, uh, lipid-rich uh, kind of food. And that helps keep you warm. And it tastes good. So, um, so uh, this technique requires a little bit more uh, technology, you know, Mashing up the ends of the bones is fairly simple. Uh, boiling them is more complicated. First of all, you need a container. And in, um, in the Paleolithic, for instance, in before the Neolithic, in most cases, um, we need to create these containers. We don't have any pottery uh, in the Paleolithic. And so we need to create some kind of a container uh, that's going to be waterproof. So we can either carve a wooden bowl or we can make a bark bucket and seal the uh, joins with uh, pitch or something like that. Or we can create stone bowls. That's a lot of work. Uh, or we can uh, weave tight baskets very, very tightly. Uh, and that's a lot of work too. Uh, so there's a lot of work to create the containers. And then we need to create the fires to, and we need to collect stones that will not fracture uh, with a lot of heat. Um, and then we need to create tongs to put the rocks in the fires and take the rocks out when they're glowing hot, uh, glowing red, and uh, they're so hot. And then we need to put the top rocks in the water and that, cre that creates the boiling context for removing the, the lipids from the stone, from the from the cancellous tissues that we're trying to extract. So um, that is uh, why soups are so important in uh, hunting and gathering societies, especially in northern climates, like in the Upper Paleolithic, the time when uh, the eyes of the leopard, the story of Sev takes place. And that's why uh, soups feature uh, importantly in that story. And you might, uh, when you get around to reading that story, you might pay attention to uh, where soups occur and what context they're in. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed this. I should mention as well that 
Troops continue to be important in Neolithic societies and even up into the Shang uh, dynasty where they're talked about in glowing terms, uh, soups for the ancestors uh, in some of the Shang uh, uh, poems. At any rate, I hope you enjoy this and I hope it was informative and I'll be back with more um, on another uh, video. Okay, take care and happy eating soup. <laughs>